Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Contextual Service Assurance, or BIG, New Requirements, New Opportunities, sponsored by Kyoko. Before we begin, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. On the right-hand side of your screen is the Q&A. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can type your questions into the Q&A box and submit your questions to our speakers. All questions will be saved, so if you don't get to answer you, you may follow up via email. At the bottom of your audience console are multiple application widgets you can use. If you have any technical difficulties, please click on the yellow help widget. So you can find answers to common questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available for download in the green resource book widget. Towards the end of today's presentation, we'll ask for your feedback. Our survey will pop open on your screen and will only take one minute to complete. Your feedback is extremely helpful. An on-demand version of the webcast will be available about one day at the event and can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier today. I would now like to turn the event over to heavy reading to Principal Analyst Gabe Brown. Gabe? Okay, thank you, Caitlin, and uh, hello, hello again, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on contextual service assurance for 5G, new requirements, new opportunities. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Um, we certainly appreciate uh, your attention and, and participation. We hope you find uh, the session informative and useful. 5G, of course, is the new generation mobile technology now under development and soon to be commercially deployed. It is, uh, in certain aspects, uh, revolutionary. Uh, the aim really is to enable a range of diverse services that will impact every industry worldwide and, of course, uh, give an uplift to the operator business itself. Uh, this, in turn, drives massive uh, and, at times, disruptive change in networks. And clearly, service assurance must evolve to meet these new demands. So the purpose of the webinar is to investigate uh, the new demands of 5G uh, and how what we're calling contextual service assurance can enable uh, or ultimately enable a closed loop uh, network healing and automation. Uh, in this uh, context, contextual uh, assurance refers in the first instance to being able to uh, monitor horizontal infrastructure running multiple different service types uh, that adapt uh, and being able to adapt uh, dynamically. Uh, in the second, uh, it's really to extend beyond the network service interaction uh, to include uh, information and data from the business domain uh, to uh, inform policy uh, and actually make uh, policy type decisions. We'll talk about uh, you know, what exactly in, you know, contextual service assurance is as we go through. Um, my name uh, is Gabriel Brown, as, as you heard. I'm principal analyst with Heavy Reading, where I lead our mobile network research coverage. I'm also host and moderator for today. I'm joined by our two expert speakers from Tioco. Uh, so first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Danny Isaacson from uh, Tioco, Senior Director of Technology and Strategy. Uh, welcome, Danny. Could you uh, say a few words uh, about uh, your role at Tioco? Sure. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. I'm happy to be here. Uh, my name is Daniel Isaacson, and I am Senior Director of Technology and Strategy in Tioco, responsible for 5G and IoT uh, solutions uh, within the service assurance lines of business uh, in Teoco. Uh, thank you. Okay, terrific, thanks. And we also have uh, Dima Alkin, who is VP Service Assurance for Teoco in North America. Welcome, Dima. Thank you, Gabriel. Good morning, uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, Dima Alkin with Teoco. Uh, as part of my role, I'm focused on the solutions, innovation that can bring measurable and practical value to our customers. And recently, it increasingly includes a lot of focus on machine learning and AI that we will be discussing today in the context of 5G. Yeah, okay, terrific. So uh, in the preparation for, for the webinar, both, you know, I've established both uh, speakers here are, are very open to taking questions. Uh, obviously, they have a lot more information than they can present uh, formally. So I'd encourage uh, everybody to take advantage of that. Uh, you can submit a question at any time during the event via the Q&A box on your screen. Um, and we'll look to, we're aiming to leave uh, 10, 15 minutes for Q&A at the end, and you know, where appropriate, maybe I'll uh, work one or two into the flow of the presentation. Now, in terms of agenda, I'm just going to give a, a, a short introduction. We'll then hear from uh, Danny, who will take us through essentially the bulk of the presentation on contextual service assurance, uh, with Dima uh, then talking about some of the new initiatives in the fields of machine learning and AI, uh, as, as he just mentioned. I should also point out I've uh, written a, uh, a, a new white paper uh, on behalf of Chioka, and that's available uh, for download. You'll see a link uh, at the end of the deck here. 
So with that, uh, on to the introduction. Now, probably the key point about 5G is that, uh, uh, is that the development specification and actually the eventual deployment and operation are all uh, uh, what we would call service-driven. A significant amount of work has, has already happened within the industry actually prior to even the start of standardization. And I guess, as you all know, various sort of uh, categories of use case have, have, have been defined, EMBB, massive IoT, and ultra-reliable low-latency uh, communications. Um, uh, we believe that heavy ring operators have uh, opportunities really to extend uh, along each of these dimensions, um, perhaps over time, you know, starting with uh, the, the, the core service and extending and, and reaching out to more demanding uh, applications as the capability grows. I think really importantly as well, um, 3GPP now formally recognizes the role of uh, network operations, how you actually manage uh, things like network slices running in the cloud and so on. So I think there's still a lot of work for the, for the industry to do and contribute here, uh, but it is good to see it uh, sort of reflected as, as part of the specification process. So I'm um, just going to give a, a, a quick update on, on activity uh, towards uh, launch. Uh, first thing to say is there's uh, really a lot happening uh, pretty much in, in every global region. Um, I'll just run through quickly a, a couple of the highlights here. Obviously, North America uh, is, is interesting for a number of reasons. I think in particular, uh, because you're seeing the span of um, uh, deployment plans from you know, low band 600 megahertz with T-Mobile right up to 28. A gig uh, millimeter wave with, with Verizon, AT&T, Sprint also doing some interesting things there in uh, mid-band. Uh, across in Europe, uh, really a big ramp in activity uh, lately and, you know, um, arguably could be one of the, could be the, 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 the sort of star region. Um, uh, I don't know if anyone saw, but a few weeks ago, a Telia a company, the Scandinavian in, uh, incumbent, said it would launch a commercial service in uh, uh, late 2018. Um, it's going to be quite a limited service, uh, of course, uh, but nevertheless, they were the first to launch LTE, and I think they want to, to, to do the same uh, with 5G. Uh, and then it goes to 20, 2019. I mean, there's, there's tons of activity, but I think um, uh, last week, uh, Telecom Italia Mobile said it would cover uh, two cities in um, uh, south of Italy uh, in 2019 uh, and go live. That includes a, a couple of the, the largest container port shipping ports in, in Europe. So you can sort of see it's not just uh, sort of consumer smartphone type services, but also some of the industrial applications. And then Vodafone just was just at an event uh, yesterday. The Vodafone CTO said also in Italy, in Milan, where they have a pre-standard uh, pre test network online, uh, they're looking to put, in 2018, they're going to go live with uh, 60 base stations. I think that will give them coverage of about 80% of, of, of the region, the area. And then in 2019, add another 60 for uh, essentially 100% coverage. So uh, that's in band 43, for example. Uh, we then have um, you know, lots of activity in, in, in Asia Pac. I mean, uh, for, 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 for my money, I think Docomo is still really the flagship operator there, but there's, there's, there's plenty happening in Korea uh, and China as well. You know, is making a big push, and there's a there's a sort of a desire there um, uh, from from uh, the, 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 the the Ministry of Communications such that actually Chinese operators should be the first to launch, and you know they're making a C-band spectrum available uh, for that. To just mention quickly, I had my first. Um, you know, live uh, drive uh, drive test of 5G in uh, London just this morning. Um, you know, we, we, it, we're not really talking handsets, but it was a, a real on-air system, moving, uh, non-line of sight, and uh, very, very good performance. I was extremely impressed. Of course, that is a, a, a pre-standard system uh, at this stage. So, uh, tons happening. Now, in terms of getting to uh, a, a, a sort of a deployment and commercial launch timeline, um, I think I still think we're talking 2020 onward for really, if you think about, you know, uh, mass market, generally available uh, type devices, particularly smartphones with both 4G and 5G. Um, I don't see that that's going to change that much, albeit, we, yeah, we will see some, some, some earlier launches, but probably uh, uh, not really at scale. Um, I think a really important thing to, to, to be aware of at this stage is uh, there's, there's kind of two development tracks leading uh, to that same place. Uh, the first of these is, is the idea you can deploy a non-standalone, 5G and non-standalone mode. So that's putting a 5G radio, new radio, uh, on top of essentially an LTE network. Uh, the LTE provides the uh, sort of signaling control and, and so forth. 
uh, and also the 4G core. This is going to be um, you know a lot faster uh, uh, and a lot simpler. And you know, a number of operators are sort of are pretty much committed to this path. Sometimes people call it uh, early drop, um, but it's also going to be a little bit more limited in terms of the number of services you can provide. Uh, full 5G, and so sorry, the early drop is shown in red on the on the boxes here. Uh, full 5G uh, with a, a new uh, system architecture called 5GS, so uh, with a 5G core. Uh, that is also scheduled for uh, release 15 due to freeze in, in June of uh, 2018 and, and sort of be uh, released as specifications three months later in, in, in September. So um, uh, that, that is, of course, a lot more complex, uh, but it is really important for things like end-to-end uh, -end network slicing and a lot of more advanced applications I showed uh, a couple of slides ago. Uh, and when we start talking about uh, standalone full 5G, I guess we're talking uh, again, well, we are talking uh, 2020 uh, onwards for that. So um, just a, now a, a quick run through some of the, the, the big challenges of, of 5G, which of course we expect to deploy uh, largely uh, on, a, on, a, on a sort of cloud style infrastructure. Um, uh, first thing to point out is you know, data volumes in terms of uh, analytics data and so forth is going to be vast. You know, networks already generate a vast amount of, of, of analytics data. Uh, that's only going to increase, um, you know, perhaps an uh, order of magnitude or more, starting to see um, uh, coming off not just the cloud monitoring systems, but, you know, we could, some, some of the vendors are talking about bringing telemetry uh, right off uh, the silicon in, in some of the new products coming out. way to deal with that really is through uh, some of the sort of machine learning and contextual analysis. So these are things that uh, Dima will be talking about. As I mentioned, it's going to be a cloud-based, certainly on the on the network side of of, of the RAN. Um, a whole bunch of features here that that, that that need to come in. So you're not only monitoring the network functions themselves, but also the underlying uh, physical infrastructure you need to move towards things like virtual probes and, and multi-layer uh, root cause analysis. And network slicing, uh, very important uh, for the, uh, commercially uh, for operators in in in, in whatever form it, it ends up taking. I think the, the, the major issue here, and Danny will have more on this, is you deploy multiple different applications, each with a different set of uh, performance requirements and different set of thresholds in terms of what's acceptable, um, but on a common infrastructure. So uh, somehow uh, uh, you need to monitor not only the performance service uh, level of the, the slice itself, but also the infrastructure that underlays that. So in, in the case that you may have uh, people um, services competing uh, for resources. Uh, uh, talked a bit about uh, the new use cases and such like. I think ultimately we may be some way from this, but ultimately um, uh, it, it's, it's my view that, and, 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 and I know some operators are thinking in these terms already, you need to get to a, a, a situation where we have user configurable services. So being able to enterprises, for example, being able to create and configure their slice uh, through some kind of a, a console type uh, uh, mechanism. If you're using consoles, you don't want to be feeding them out the back end for then manual uh, configuration by the operator. That actually has to go right into the network uh, automatically. Uh, finally, on the RAN side, uh, an enormous amount to talk about here. I think the, 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 the simple thing is to say there's just going to be a lot more diversity in terms, in terms of the RAN, both in terms of uh, spectrum, uh, but particularly uh, the, the numerology that goes with it to adapt uh, your radio link, even if it's running on, on common hardware, to adapt the radio link to the particular uh, user or, or slice type. And again, uh, a, a bunch of new tools can come in. Interesting to see how uh, SON is actually, you know, obviously it's been, it's been around a while. That, 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 that's ramping up uh, right now in the, in the 3G and, and 4G networks in terms of the, the number of deployments. So with that, I'm going to hand the call over to uh, Danny at Tioko. Danny, please, the, the, the slides are yours. Well, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks, Gabriel. This is a wonderful and excellent introduction. I am very excited to be able to discuss with you the topic of contextual service assurance, which is what I intend to do within the next uh, 20 minutes. I will be discussing with you why 5G networks acquire a paradigm shift in service assurance solutions and why uh, contextual service assurance embodies this shift. In other words, what's so different in service assurance solutions for 5G in relation to 4G or any other G, and what is so contextual about it? Um, just to mention, we have a Q&A session at the end of the next section. I encourage you, please, to ask questions. We will be, you know, striving to ask as many as time allows. 
And also we have two polls intertwined with this dish presentation, and uh, we encourage you also please to answer them. Going to the, uh, the first uh, slide, what we see here is this slide summarizes the main characteristics of 5G as specified for, by different standard bodies involved in the, the definitions, such as uh, 3GPP, 5GPP, NGNM, METIS2, and so forth. When I look at it, for me, 5G is more than anything a technological framework that includes the evolution of existing technologies alongside new technologies and methods. Uh, Gary alluded to that, that uh, 5G is in a sense an evolution and it's also a revolution. The revolutionary part of 5G is that it uh, will enable a synergistic ena a approach uh, for uh, implementing many use cases and capabilities catering to many disparate users in the, the slicing. Basically, slicing will, will uh, tackle that. Many of those users will be human, of course, but m m many more of them will be actually things, and that's part of the IoT, IOE explosion, that some claim will happen in full force only with 5G. So if we look at the different characteristic changes that the 5G will bring forth, we see that the following going from left to right. Gravel talked about it already, uh, the higher the data volumes, we're talking about an increase in about three orders of magnitude in relation to characteristic values of data volume density as provided by current technologies. We're talking about a density of about 10 terabytes per second per kilometer square, which means when we go into the service assurance, uh, what type of requirements from a big data perspective, distributed mediation, real-time uh, uh, collection, we are going to talk all about that. And uh, when we go to the next box, we see that uh, the densification is not just antennas, it's mainly devices. We're going, the massive IoT is bringing forth millions of devices, uh, we're talking about a, a characteristic uh, density of about one million devices per kilometer square. And for me, this piece of information, because I also deal with IoT, embodies more than anything else, the huge change in the number and type of connected devices due to this explosion. We, we already have, and we will have more and more connected things, like clothes, light poles, smart meters, medical devices, drones, and many more. Every day brings a new thing to be connected to. The last three boxes talk basically about three different use cases of 5G. The first use case, which is EMMB, goes for the bandwidth hunger type of applications, and then we're talking about typical use uh, uh, peak data rates of about 20 to 10 gigabits per second, depending if the downlink or uplink. And we are going to find the ultra high definition video, virtual reality, augmented reality, and so forth. So it's going to be one slide tackling that. Then there is the URLC, the ultra high level low latency communications, which requires a decrease of about an order of magnitude in, in, in uh, uh, latencies to the sort of 0 0.5 to 1 millisecond, and this is for uh, autonomous cars, uh, for real-time uh, real control of uh, robotic uh, in, uh, arms in factories, tactile internet, and so forth. And the third one, which we call MMTC, Massive Machine Type Communications, is mainly for the massive internet, the type of millions of sensors that we deploy in a kind of a fire and forget uh, uh, type of approach, these guys need to live between 10 to 15 years on, on, a, on a pair of batteries. The only way to do that is they, if they are uh, emitting, transmitting with very, very low energy. So energy suddenly becomes a very important KPI to be, measuring, to be measured in 5G networks, what we call energy efficiency. So the idea is that we have these three main use cases, as we see in the next uh, slide. EMMB, AMBB, URLC, and MMTC, and, ba and basically the slides are going to occur from an end-to-end -end perspective along and for these use cases, and the users of these uh, use cases are, being, uh, are called tenants of the slices. Now, these slices can be assigned different uh, uh, frequencies, but so each one can uh, have its own resources, but many times, specifically in dense areas, they're going to compete for the same pool of resources, whether it's frequencies, uh, virtual uh, partitions, or anything like that. So in that case, uh, the uh, context of a multi-slice environment is something important to understand from a service assurance perspective. We, we will see that the world context enters into our lexicon more and more as we go in, in this uh, presentation. Let's go to the next slide. So if we want to summarize the concepts that uh, uh, 5G brings as a, as a technological framework, 
We talked about network sliding. We're going to talk more in the context of service assurance. Then there is also the issue of virtualization. We started with a virtualized core, but uh, uh, 5G also brings the virtualization of the RAN, basically the splitting between the baseband unit functions and the radio unit function, baseband unit being in the data center and radio units being on poles, on rooftops, on towers, and so forth. This is very important, but we need also to take into consideration that uh, there is a lot of existing infrastructure, what we call sunk investment, so the networks are going to be hybrid. And, and the management of these uh, networks has to attend this hybrid type of uh, management, which means we need to manage all the different layers of uh, uh, the virtualized infrastructure, but we also need to manage uh, what, will, what will become legacy, which are the physical routers, switches, bridges, and, and, and gateways, and so forth. So that adds another uh, dimension of complexity, especially when we talk about multi-domain and multi-technology, and if you like, multi-generational correlational type of uh, exercise. Mobile edge computer is a very interesting concept, which is related to the fact that uh, for some specific latency uh, uh, demanding, uh, the type of slices that demand very, very low latency, they added the uh, computational and, and the latency and the latency of the hop between the radio unit and the data center and the core is too long. Uh, so what uh, it needs to be done is basically to bring the, the, the real-time actions, uh, whether it's caching, transcoding, uh, analytics, or anything, closer to the network. So the more uh, latency sensitive the slice is, the closer uh, uh, this edge computer needs to be uh, within, to the edge of the network, within the edge of the network. Another concept which is interesting, but I don't have a lot of time to talk about, is uh, uh, ICN. That goes for, uh, um, it's a concept that uh, uh, Cisco is uh, uh, pushing. It's information-centric uh, networking. And the idea is to replace partially or totally the IP-based routing and uh, uh, change it or replace it with name content-based uh, routing. I don't have to dwell on this, but I think it's interesting enough to put it in the presentation. So uh, I would encourage you to go to, to Cisco or to Google and, and find more about it. Uh, if we want to summarize what we have been talking about, I think that this slice is very good because it shows that slices are going to be end-to-end -end creatures, basically encompassing core, encompassing edge, and of course encompassing the radio network. These uh, slices can, are going to be along the, the specific use cases uh, uh, defined uh, by uh, 5G, like uh, uh, MMTC, URLC, and so forth. And we see that uh, they will have different uh, uh, applications at the edge and different applications at the core. Everything is going to be as much as possible virtualized with the caveat that we are talking in the foreseeable future about a hybrid, a hybrid infrastructure. The new radio, which is uh, uh, one of the many innovations that uh, 5G brings forth, how, also, it, it's a lot of things. It's new modulations, uh, which can be 256 QAM. It's a massive MIMO. It's uh, you know uh, transmitting in very high frequencies in, in the microwave. Um, but it's also things such as a, a device-to-device -device communication, utilizing your phone as a relay. Basically, suddenly your phone might uh, convert itself for a period of time to a network element. How you monitor that? The issue of spectrum sharing, suddenly uh, uh, you start transmitting, you know, whether it's LSA, LAA, Multifier, or anything like that, in 5 gig, which is an unlicensed band. So uh, how you exactly commit the quality of service while you are doing that, and you might be, you know, doing different types of aggregations, or you are be transmitting in CBRS, which is a partially occupied band by things such as satellites, satellites and radars. So from a service assurance perspective, that, in, that adds a new uh, dimension of complexity. Another thing with uh, basically the optimization to, uh, for the Internet of Things, and I alluded to that before, the issue that you need a, a, a free energy uh, efficiency becomes one of the most important KPIs for this type of MMTC uh, slices. <clears throat> I would like to go back to the, the, the slides with a different twist uh, that uh, uh, Gabriel already talked about and convert the, uh, the, the 5G innovations into, into service assurance challenges. That is what I'm going to do in the next slides. 
So we see data volumes. They're going to be huge data volumes. We talk about it, you know, huge data dens densities. How do you cope with that? First of all, you need a couple of things, and I'm going to talk about uh, in the next slide, but you need a, a mature big data solution. You need analytics on top of that, and deep learning and machine learning, and, and Dima is going to talk about that. But also, because th there is a certain latency between the time you collect the data until you put it in, in your data repository, for things that require real-time type of monitor, what you need is in-memory analytics in the edge. The same as you have mobile edge computing, we will have a mediation analytics. You have a distributed analytics, and some of the analytics needs to be done in memory, in real time, at mediation level. Things such as the dimensional aggregation, basic API calculation, basic actuation, things like that. And then this is like the, sh the, the very uh, initial analytics, and, and the rest of it, you know, that needs you know deep learning and trending and, and, and history. You do it over your data lake. So this is the first thing. The second thing is cloud and SDN, and I would say cloud SDN and hybrid architectures. And there, uh, you need to monitor and correlate between all these different things. Also, uh, uh, monitor the multi-layer structure of uh, the NFB and SDN. If you talk about network slicing, for me, network slicing is the most important innovation within uh, uh, 5G. And there, you need to be aware of a specific slice, the context of that slice, the context of multiple slices uh, uh, fighting for uh, uh, the same pool of resources, what are the OLAs and SLAs of each one of the different slices, what is the, the specific trend in one slice, which might be, you know, a deteriorated trend, applying policies and machine learning in order to distill from this trend uh, uh, a recommendation or a command via standard interfaces and APIs to the orchestrator, and after the orchestrator effect, whatever changes in the network to onboard the, the changes that the orchestrator have affected uh, so you can change your baselines and your configuration. There are multiple use cases, and in some of the use, some of the use cases, especially in the IoT use cases, uh, within the context of information that uh, you receive, also sensor data might become very important for some of the use cases. And run diversity, we talked about it, is it's a configuration issue, it's an optimization issue, but it's also a monitoring issue, especially when you are, uh, you know, transmitting in unlicensed bands or where you're utilizing network D2D uh, uh, type of communications and so forth. So let's go now and deep dive a little into what are the main challenges of this uh, contextual uh, service assurance. So the first thing we notice is that the, the network is going to be very dynamic. We will have a bunch of slices, even, uh, you know, below, under one specific uh, cell site. You can have one tenant that, uh, you know, uh, subscribes to two, to two slices. For instance, a connected car can, can be a, a tenant of a V2V, which is a URLC type of slice, but it might be also a tenant of an EMBB slice uh, because uh, for the use case of a car as a mobile hotspot. So you will have uh, uh, slices multiple slices with the same tenant. You might have uh, multiple tenants on different slices. They might compete uh, the, the, over the same resources. You might have situations where one or more needs to scale out and at the expense of whom they, they scale out if you are running out of resources. At the end of the day, all this dynamicity of the network requires a cognitive inventory. And by that, what do I mean? Usually, configuration uh, 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 tools within service assurance tools are snapshots. They look at what's going on right now, what is the latest snapshot discovered or onboarded from, uh, from the network, and then you see, okay, I, this is uh, uh, my correlation based on topology, this is my this is my service, these are my service models, this is my impact analysis, but I usually don't keep history. Now, because of the dynamic nature of uh, uh, this, you, you, you must start having uh, uh, what we call cognitive inventory, the ability to keep some history, inventory awareness of changes over time, because that changes your baselines, that changes your service models, changes many, many things. And in order to do that, you need to be, uh, 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 to be you need to extend your auto-discovery capabilities from, from a depth perspective, but also from a time granularity perspective, and also within the closed loop interaction with uh, the orchestrator, uh, uh, you need to be able to onboard whatever changes and understand whatever changes the orchestrator has done to the network and, and then understand 
how these changes affect the different slices, your baselines, your SLAs, and so forth. So this is one thing. On the other, on the other hand, you have also the issue of NFB. You need to be able to, in order to support multi-layer NFB support, you have to have a, a, to model from a configuration perspective all these uh, structures, both from a, a legacy perspective, the physical network and the uh, virtual network, and from a CRAN perspective, from the uh, uh, cloud run perspective, you need to be able to understand the new domains and the new entities, such as the front hall, uh, uh, mobile edge computing servers, uh, baseband unit, and so forth. For instance, the implementation of front hall, which is basically based on massive deployment of fiber, <coughs> creates another point of uh, 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 failure, in a sense, because now before that, you have only fiber cuts, in the back, uh, fiber cuts in the back hole. Now you might have fiber cuts in the front hole. And how do you correlate that from a multi-domain perspective and how you understand which impact this specific problem has on the slices, on the quality of the service, on the quality of experience. So that becomes an interesting challenge. From a real-time perspective, you have massive number of devices. We talked about one million devices per kilometer square. So how do, you, how do you collect all this information? You have to have distributed collection agents. These distributed collection agents have to be able to uh, load share and uh, affect data and, and assure or ensure data persistency. So they have to uh, uh, hold uh, information and, uh, in case that there is a disconnect with the network and be able to synchronize uh, uh, with the OSS system when uh, communication resumes. Uh, so we're talking about uh, uh, load sharing capabilities, horizontal and vertical mediation scalabilities, but also being able to, uh, in, a, in the shortest possible time, being able to load into the big data repository all the information that is coming. And as I said before, also being able to affect some level of analytics in memory over the mediation. Another very important point is that uh, uh, we're talking about uh, uh, 3G was about collection granularity of uh, 15 minutes, uh, 5G is about, uh, 4G is about 5 minutes, IP is about 1 minute. Here we're talking about minute and, and sub-minute collection. The ability to pull information every X seconds from a network element or from a specific, even at an end-to-end -end slice level, because uh, if you're talking about su sudden changes in latency, you need to be able to gauge those sudden latest in, uh, changes in latency in uh, as real time as possible. So we have to have a policy that the minute that you detect that there are, there are degradations in quality of service, for instance, start a much higher frequency of collection jobs from the network and support all the different uh, protocols for collection of data. The monitoring per slice, SLA and OLA, basically we're talking about uh, having thresholds per slice, intelligent thresholds. Some of these thresholds have to be automated thresholds, not just manual thresholds, so machine learning goes into this as well. You have to be linked to the cognitive inventory because you have to get the information about changing baselines and changing service models and changing the configuration of, uh, of the slice itself. Maybe the slice has scaled out, so you need to understand now the scale out because your, your occupancy uh, KPIs or your load KPIs may, might change according to the, the baseline that has changed. You have to have a contextual monitoring of KPIs in relation to the uh, QR, QR quality of service and quality of experience, uh, perspective of each one of the slides. The notifications and policies have to be adjusted per slice type. It's different uh, when you detect a degradation in quality of service in a URLC than when you detect a problem in connectivity assurance for an MMTC. And these things need to be coded uh, or uh, also from a machine learning perspective, learned uh, as the system develops. Uh, also, another very important point is the fact that uh, the scale-in and scale-out mechanisms, uh, the, the commands that you send uh, to the orchestrator to scale-in and scale-out uh, uh, slices, they need to be based on the asterisk uh, type of policies. What do I mean by that? You cannot scale-in and scale-out within with the same thresholds, because if you do that, you might, in, you might get back to the same situation you just escaped from, right? So the idea is that when you apply hysteresis based triggering and mechanisms in order to decouple the triggers that affect the scale in and scale out, and this is very important, uh, because it will enable you to avoid 
going back to the same situation you just uh, moved out from. So <clears throat> summarizing all these, what we see here is basically that 5G mandates closing the loop. The idea in order to uh, affect those changes, service assurance looks at the context of one slice, at the, its SLAs and OLAs, at the context of a multiple, a multi-slice uh, uh, enabled, look at the, uh, the, hybrid at the hybrid network, collect the data from it, and then after application of policy and uh, with a machine learning overlay on top of that, there's still some type of uh, uh, contextual slice, uh, uh, scale in or scale out commands and recommendation, which via REST APIs, JSON, and, and all the different types of uh, uh, APIs as, as recommended by bodies like TM4 and so forth, they are sent to the orchestrator. The orchestrator does whatever it does, change, effective changes in the network, and we need to onboard these changes back and change our own baseline. This Closing the loop, this virtuous circle of optimization lies in, in the core of the ability to monitor slices per their specific quality of service SLAs and uh, OLAs. Uh, now we are going into, I finished this part, and we are going now to a, to a poll. Uh, yeah, good. Um, so, yeah, thanks, thanks Danny. Um, this is uh, uh, Gabriel with heavy reading here again. Um, uh, as Danny mentioned, we're going to the uh, poll question. We're asking, actually, on this topic of, of, of closed loop, how important do you think closed loop automation in 5G really is? You can see the various options there from uh, not important at all to uh, it's a must if, if network slicing is to be implemented. We also have another there for folks who, who don't want to commit one way or the other. Be terrific if you could all take this. It's not a not a scientific poll. We're not committing you a view that 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 will come back to you in a few years and say, but you said this. It's just to get a sense of uh, how um, how thing you know how how the audience is sort of sentiment uh, to, to, to to the question at the moment. I give everyone a, a moment or two to um, uh, to take that. Do we have? Um, a good few votes coming in already, and okay, let's give it another um, another five seconds before I push the answers live. Okay, here we go. Okay, so uh, we can see three percent not important at all, three percent some importance. Important but not critical, 30%, uh, 61%, it's a must, and 3% uh, other. Um, Danny, I guess um, pretty much validates your, your view there that, that, that 5G uh, mandates closing the loop. Any, any thoughts or, or, or analysis of that result there? Uh, thank you very much. No, it's very interesting. I actually uh, looking at this and, and uh, yes, because I agree 100%. I mean, it's imp at the beginning, maybe if uh, 5G, you know, is implemented uh, in, in a partial fashion for, let's say, FWA, fixed wireless access, or things like that, and it, uh, slices are not yet implemented, then it's going to be important uh, for the future to be, you know, prepared for it, but not critical. But I agree 100% with the 60% here. It is a mass if network slicing is to be implemented. So I'm very happy about these results. Thank you very much, uh, Gabriel. Yeah, I guess the thing I hear quite quite a lot from from service providers, obviously they want they want closed loop. It's just that it's going to take some time, you know, to to build confidence and tools need to mature and so forth. So, so my feeling is yes, I I, I, I agree. Uh, I feel it's going to be a kind of a phased introduction. Um, you know, it's my, my my perspective on that. Okay, so uh, we've had uh, we've had from Danny. I'm now going to hand over for Dima for the the, the final section. We have a, a few slides here and, a, and another poll before we go to Q and A. Uh, do submit questions, uh, by the way, uh, uh, as we go through. Okay, with that, I'm going to hand over to Dima. The controls are yours. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, Danny. So we'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the um, growing role of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in uh, 5G service assurance and why and how they will become kind of an integral part of the operations and the engineering. First of all, why? Why? Because now we can. Uh, much of the um, data science behind the uh, machine learning techniques that we will be using 
has been known for a while, but the advancement of the cloud computing and data center virtualization and general improvements in hardware processing capabilities now enable the use of the machine learning and AI more broadly and efficiently than ever before. Another aspect that made the wider use of ML and AI possible is the availability of the relevant data. But no matter how advanced the available algorithms are, they're useless if the relevant data is not uh, available to us when we need it. But it's important with that to understand that uh, ML and AI are not merely some cool technology to play with just because it's available. It's rather going to be an integral part of the future network operations for several reasons. And let's take a look at some of those reasons. First, with the evolution of 5G deployment, the amount of actionable data provided and generated by the network is going to simply become overwhelming. So our traditional approach as the telecom industry uh, was using is for decades is simply putting more people and introduce some simplistic automation to process and act upon more data. But the volume and the level of complexity as Danny outlined that is coming with 5G uh, this manual or semi-automated operations mode is simply no longer scalable. You just cannot build uh, enough knocks and uh, trouble ticketing processing to uh, handle it in the current fashion. Also, as Gabriel and Danny outlined, many of the previous technology evolution steps were introduced in a kind of gradual incremental mode. Maybe with the exception of from the move from 1G to 2G, the rest came in a very kind of gradual fashion. 5G is different in the extent that we are introducing several new technologies and architectural innovations in parallel. NSV, SDN, edge computing, seamless handover between various types of radio access technology, throne hole concept, and more, all of that kind of happening together. The third aspect which um, Danny mentioned briefly is um, the, the fact that there is a blurring uh, border between the network equipment and the user device. So not only will have hundreds of thousands of uh, millions of traditional kind of small cells of all kinds, we will also have almost like consumer type devices like Sprint Magic Box or the 5G small cell radio that Verizon is experimenting with right now and all the Wi-Fi hotspots and the much wider use of unlicensed spectrum. All that combined is, will be used to provide the required network coverage and speed. So we'll have cases also where one consumer or IoT device will serve as a relay for other consumers or things. So on one hand, we cannot practically treat all those devices as true network elements, the same way we treat the macro cell sites and our core and major routers and gateways, etc. On the other hand, we cannot treat them as we treat the consumer devices and the CPUs today in the enterprise environment, where whether it's up or down or malfunctioning, at the end, it's still just an individual customer problem. So we'll have to find ways to collect the relevant data from all those different kinds of devices, process it, and create meaningful, actionable insights while not giving those individual devices too much attention. And this is one of the very real challenges that uh, simply cannot be addressed by current, uh, many of the current tools and processes in place. And this is where ML and AI are going to be a must, uh, and we're already working with some of our customers on this specific issue. So with all that in mind, if we look on the um, kind of right side of the slide, we need to remember that uh, machine learning and AI uh, are the tools, not the end goal. So they will enable automation. They will help control and reduce the uh, costs, uh, which many people in the industry actually see as the, one of the major drivers for, towards 5G beyond uh, just the kind of use cases that Danny outlined. And they will also drive complex real-time decision-making. One of the most interesting uh, areas where ML and AI use will be um, in context of combining the network and customer data with the business policies. So as Danny described, eventually uh, the NFV uh, as the enabled 5G network with this, all this on-demand slicing capability of goodness will create a very dynamic and agile environment. But what we tend to forget sometimes that not everything that makes sense from network perspective and not everything that is possible will necessarily make sense from a business perspective. We have to remember that at the end of the day, we're still always dealing with a finite amount of resources, no matter how dynamic they are. So whatever we do for an individual customer or an enterprise or an IoT service provider will potentially be on the expense of other customers relying on the same network resources. Or for example, 
just the fact that we have access to external cloud resources, which are almost endless kind of from our point of view, does not mean that we need to increase the use of those cloud resources on demand, because the cost, which is typically usage-driven in the cloud environment, uh, may well end to uh, being much higher than the resulting revenue from the customers that we are trying to serve in this uh, on-demand uh, fashion. Um, so if we uh, take a look on some of the specific uh, use cases um, themselves, some of them new generation of traditional service assurance use cases, and some of them are uh, very new in 5G environment. If you take a look, for example, at the host cause analysis, classical service assurance use case, which was traditionally driven by uh, all kinds of rules and expert systems, and then evolved to take advantage uh, of the network topology. This, is, this approach is simply not good enough anymore, because not only the available network topology is not uh, timely in many times and not accurate, in some cases the network is simply going to be too dynamic. So there is no really topology to rely on, and definitely in this combined hybrid new generation and legacy world, there is no magical repository that describes the entire network topology across all the layers. So we are migrating towards machine learning driven techniques, which are all about analyzing historical data without relying on topology or any kind of rules, creating signatures, identifying root causes, and then applying this model knowledge in real time as alarms and performance data uh, are reported from the network. Another rapidly evolving need is around the massive forecasting, as the amount of network entities to be forecasted and projected is growing exponentially. We cannot treat them individually anymore, again, as in the past, where we simply kind of forecasted every entity on its own. So some of the algorithms that we will be using will focus on creating forecasting models for groups of network elements, uh, be it by type, geography, or any other attribute and then automatically classifying individual network elements and deploying right model on the peer group level. Um, very similar approach will be applied to all kinds of anomaly detection and outline analysis. In the past, the analytics were relying heavily on analysis of the historical behavior of a given network entity, and then looking for kind of deviation from that established behavior or pattern. But uh, in 5G environment, how do you recognize an abnormal behavior of an entity which simply did not exist five minutes ago? It can be a VNF created on demand. It can be a new 5G network slice. So here again, we will be, uh, uh, the, the key will be to quickly classify this new entity according to kind of behavioral symptoms it exhibits and then apply the relevant outlier model to quickly identify deviations from this entity and kind of peer group, peer group typical behavior without comparing uh, to its own historical behavior. A um, few words about predictive analytics. There is a lot of hype in the industry uh, at the moment, but I have to say that uh, right now we're seeing a certain level of uh, skepticism, uh, primarily from the operation, because the current processes are focused on fixing what's already broken, and frankly, there are not enough resources to handle even that. But transitioning to more proactive mode with the help of machine learning and AI will actually help with both improving the network health and lowering the burden on the operations and the engineering departments. So those machine learning and AI capabilities will not exist as kind of as a standalone use cases, but will be tightly interconnected between themselves and integrated into the business processes to support the automated network monitoring and healing. Uh, one of the things that are changing, and we see some, again, uh, operational, uh, not necessarily the, the operators are ready to accept it, but to a large extent, the consumers of the analytical insights will not be the humans looking at more screens and dashboards, but rather automation engines, which will use this information for real-time decisions and executions of those decisions. Um, it's a very exciting topic. We can probably dedicate a, a very long time to, but uh, I, I think we're running a little bit short. So I just want to tell the audience, feel free to reach out to us after the webinar to continue this discussion, specifically on the machine learning and AI. And um, with that, uh, Danny, I'll turn it back to you, to the summary, and then uh, to all of us and Gabriel for the Q&A. There is a new poll. Uh... Okay, let's run the poll quickly and then we'll, we'll hit the summary. 
Um, okay. Oh yeah, so let's just get a, a, a sense from, from folks in the audience. What, what do you think the main use of machine learning and AI will be in 5G? And we've put the uh, five different options here for you. Uh, assisted network automation, slice management, capacity and traffic forecasting, service assurance and operations, or mobile edge uh, computing or multi-access edge computing applications. Um, it once again, be terrific if you could all uh, take this. Just what folk are doing so, Dima, almost as soon as you started talking on the topic, we had a question come in. Um, uh, how do you think the lack of machine learning talent can be compensated for? So even if we establish it's, it's very important, where are the, uh, where are the developers and, 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 and the skill sets you need? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very, very good question. So everybody is there. Frankly, everybody is struggling with it. Uh, because uh, there is, a, uh, first of all, not necessarily a very well-defined requirement for what is this kind of uh, knowledge and, uh, uh, that, is, that is demanded. And second, it's a rare skill set that combines the data science understanding, of course, but also understanding of the use case that you're trying to solve. Right? So you cannot, uh, there is too much kind of generic analytics uh, and engines out there and too little of uh, specifically tailored ML and AI engines to um, to focus on those service assurance or operational use cases. So there is no magic answer, obviously. I think this is where, with all the um, uh, with all the push towards more use of the open source and a lot of the internal effort that carriers are uh, investing in, this is, I think, the area where they are more open to actually rely on vendors, be it TIOC or somebody else, because this is where a lot of this expertise uh, uh, is currently uh, uh, kind of positioned, and this is where a lot of investment goes on. Because obviously, many times vendors see the broader picture than it's just a single carrier environment. But they agree yeah, to yeah, challenge yeah. in the yeah. yeah, yeah, of course you can find the scale, scale the development and so forth. Okay, let's have a look at these uh, poll results, and then I'll ask you to, to, to comment, uh, Dima, as they come out. So uh, assisted network automation, 18%, size management, 3%, capacity forecasting, 15 Obviously, the big winner here at 55 service mm -hmm. assurance and operations, 9% for edge computing. Um, thoughts on that, Dima? Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, somewhat, uh, I would say, almost kind of positively surprised by the uh, 54 and a half percent uh, uh, of the vote going towards service assurance and operations, because traditionally, and that's what I think we're seeing still in the NFV and the DN, even though it's changing, service assurance and operations uh, was more of an afterthought, right? So we typically deal with the network first, deploy the network, and then we start figuring out service assurance and operations piece. But now I think there is more realization, also maybe a lesson learned from uh, uh, NFV and the SDN operationalization challenges, that with 5G, we'll have to think about service assurance and operations from day one. And again, with all those complexities and challenges that we described, the use of machine learning and AI will be a necessity, not uh, an option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very good point. Okay, I'm going to hand back to Danny for the for the wrap up slide before the Q and A. Do uh, do submit your questions. Uh, we're going to get to them in a moment. Okay, thank you, Gabriel. Um, this summary basically talks about uh, contextual service assurance. What we see here is that uh, in this uh, new service assurance that needs to correspond to all these new uh, developments that uh, uh, 5G is bringing forth, there are a lot of context of information that we need to take into consideration. Uh, when we do contextual uh, service assurance, when we apply policies, and we, we affect uh, closed-loop automation. We're talking about the expectation uh, context. Which slices are there? Which SLAs and, OS and OLAs are, uh, you know, pertinent to these specific slices? That's the first context we need to take into consideration. There is also the informational context, which is IOE and reference data. Reference data can be many things. Reference data can be even weather data. Let's say that we have a an accident that is coming because of weather data, then we have an accumulation of cars, and then we have suddenly on a specific a a area, a the density of car increases to the point that all the um, slices that these cars were tenants to suddenly become congested. So the, inform the, the reference context can, can provide, you know, the contextual understanding of what's going on. The monitored context basically is what are the KPIs that we need to uh, monitor in order to... Um, 
to provide really this service assurance, uh, whether it's a user expected, a user experience data rate, whether it's a, you know, slides occupancy and so forth, each slice will have their, these specific own KPIs and what are the trend analytics that we need to apply and uh, because we don't want to be reactive, we want to be predictive and proactive. So what type of thresholds we need to apply, this is the context of the uh, real-time monitoring. And there is also another context that Dima and, and Gabriel talked about it before, which is the business context. We have a multi-slice uh, 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 environment, which slices are competing, you know, for the same uh, pool of resources. Which slice do I scale out or scale in uh, in relation to the specific services, the, 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 the importance of the customers, but also, you know, the, 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 the sensitivity, because some of these slices can, you know, involve risk to human lives. And there is the configuration context, which is the onboarded configuration changes. As we said before, we need a cognitive inventory. We cannot just have a regular snapshot type inventory. And all this information, all this contextual information needs to drive my policies. And, and as Dima said before, these policies can also you know, be provided by machine learning tools. And one of the things that uh, we see when we're talking about analytics is the fact that uh, many of these analytics work on history. But what you do in, uh, with a network that uh, its history, you know, it's changing all the time. So you need maybe what we call sometimes second derivative analytics, basically analytics on the rate of change. The rate of change is perhaps a better indicator than history that it's like quicksand. So there are many interesting things here, but what I wanted to, to pinpoint is the fact that you need contextual information of many different multidimensional contextual information in order to be effective in affecting your policies and provide this close automa automation uh, for service assurance in 5G networks. Uh, with that, uh, thank you very much for attending. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we can go now to the Q&A. Yeah, okay, terrific. Uh, th thank you, Danny. So I had some, uh, uh, some good questions in. Uh, Dima, I'm going to turn to you first because actually the, uh, quite a few of the questions around AI and, and so forth. The question here is, um, what kind of AI technologies are we talking about? Could legacy technologies like iLog and similar rule-based engines do the job? So uh, the great question. Uh, I would say the, the short answer is no uh, to the second part of the question, simply because we see it already today, even before 5G, uh, in the 4G plus and the NFT as the driven world, that those rule-based engines, iLog-like and other expert systems uh, are simply not sustainable. You just cannot write enough rules to describe all the possible network behavior, taking into consideration all the complexities uh, of those multi-domain, multi-layer networks. So we are talking about uh, various, we probably ded can dedicate a, a whole webinar uh, to, to answer this question, but we are um, talking about different kinds of um, uh, machine learning and AI techniques, really depends on the use case, all kinds of regression, uh, clustering, uh, much more uh, wider use of neural networks uh, and where it makes sense and uh, very focused uh, uh, deep learning. But again, it all depends on the use case. Uh, and uh, I think the art uh, in, the, in the data science is to, uh, a lot of it is trial and error and understanding which algorithms give a better and more accurate answer for each specific use case. And moreover, many times what we see in our own uh, uh, research and development effort, that it's a combination of several techniques or several algorithms that eventually lead you uh, to answer the question that you're trying to answer. So uh, this is really in a nutshell, but of course we can discuss it uh, much more at length. Sure, sure. Okay, so we move on to the next question. I guess it's probably for you as well, Dima, but um, Danny, if you, if you want to contribute. Uh, do you see machine learning gaining more support from people at the executive level or from people at the operations level? Is there any hope for machine learning if not everybody is on board? Um, yeah, great question, I think. Uh, it could be flavor of the month for executives, and they, they go on to the next thing next year. What's your feeling there, Dima? So here, yes, it depends. Uh, often it depends on the, uh, on the organizational. Yes, there is a certain level of skepticism as well as uh, uh, maybe some other kind of you know, organizational considerations. So if you have the executive uh, support and sponsorship, it, of course, it is much easier to drive it uh, uh, top down. Uh, and uh, in those cases, of course, people get on board uh, more easily. I think we as an industry, again, be it a vendor or a home-grown effort, we need to earn certain level of credibility 
And the way to earn this level of credibility is, and this is where we are working with our customers, not to try to boil the ocean, but identify specific use cases that you're trying to address where you believe that, uh, first of all, the machine learning and the AI can help, and second, that the technology is mature enough and you actually see, again, whether it is from the vendors or through your own efforts, that you can achieve immediate measurable results and not through, you know, three years uh, IT project, and then deliver those results in an agile mode. And again, people, when they see that actually new technology is helping them to do their job better, of course, then they uh, are becoming more open to use this technology uh, on a wider scale. Yeah, okay, good one. I'm going to follow up question to that then that's, that's come in. So I see uh, a question I had, more or less, I think. The uh, question is, machine learning usually applies algorithms which are black boxes, so they are hard to interpret. Uh, how do you think this will affect the span of algorithms uh, used in 5G? And I guess my question was very similar. It was, what if the machine learning uh, proposes a, a non-conventional solution? Uh, how, how can we believe in it? I think it's the same, the same kind of question yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, first of all, I think we're generally uh, kind of very forgiving uh, towards a uh, human error, right? We even have a drop down in our troubleshooting system that says human error, <laughs> but we're very unforgiving. You know, machines cannot get wrong, right? So, I think it's all about uh, the ongoing tuning of the algorithms, uh, as well as uh, uh, having parameters which are external to the algorithm. So you're not changing the algorithm as you're using it, but you can impact or kind of tweak the way it works. That's one part of it. Um, the other part of it is um, at the end of the day, machine learning and AI, the hope is that it will come with those unconventional solutions because the whole idea is that hopefully at the end it will come with better and more accurate decisions, and this is where we're actually striving to get, even if some of those decisions might not look trivial to us. Yeah, I think that's extremely, uh, extremely well, uh, well put there. That, that that people are less forgiving machines. Okay, I pushed the uh, audience evaluation format to folks' uh, screens. There, um, I'm going to ask one more question uh, before we close the call. So if you could uh, fill that in before we go, that would be uh, terrific. Um, so, uh, uh, Danny or Dima, um, uh, the question is a follow-up to that uh, uh, legacy tooling uh, question earlier. Am I correct in understanding that the legacy incumbent FCAPS systems are inadequate to deliver the required real-time measurements uh, in 5G service assurance and closed-loop automation uh, requires? Uh, Danny, do you want to take first crack at that? Sure. Yes, I think that this is uh, your understanding is correct. I think that the FCAPS systems, you know, gave a very good mapping of functionalities and and then after that they evolve into ETOM and TAM and so forth. But what we need right now in the service assurance and closed loop automation, it's, it's uh, I would say, an evolution of these uh, functionalities. And as Zima was mentioning before, also the ability to incorporate machine learning into the automation. But before even machine learning, what uh, one of the things that we need is a, is a policy engine that takes into consideration many things, including business uh, and, and the contextual information, so in, in a sense, it's kind of a merge, uh, if you like, between OSS and VSS uh, capabilities. And then on top of that, you need the machine learning in order to, to provide accurate uh, uh, results for that policy. And this, of course, needs to be, you know, in the tit and tat in, in the interaction with the orchestration. So I would say that uh, FCAPS as a basic layer of uh, 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 monitoring is still very valid, but I think that we need to evolve that in order to provide, you know, the, what is required uh, in 5G and kind of contextual service assures are, are, are alludes to that specific change. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you for that, Danny. So um, you see the survey form there. I do believe I just also give uh, folks a chance to view the white paper. I'm not quite sure um, uh, where the link has gone for that. I'll push to push the survey back. Uh, rest assured, we have it, and you should be able to find it um, very easily with a Google search or uh, via via Light Reading. Uh, should you not, uh, do drop me an email, and we'll we'll send that out. Um, with that, um, thank you all uh, uh, very much for attending. Um, I'd like to uh, thank both uh, Danny and Dima at Tioco for uh, such an informative webinar. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. And, uh, and I'd like to, to uh, once again thank everyone in the audience for attending today. Uh, thank you and goodbye.